government's official position is being implanted almost immediately here oh. by what, what has to have been a, a planned event. Here's something else, and this is really quite stunning. We have recently discovered BBC archival footage, Joe, that shows the BBC announcing the collapse of Building 7 23 minutes before the event occurred. So you have the woman reporter saying the Solomon Brothers building has collapsed, and Solomon Brothers, of course, had a huge number of floors and actually reconstructed. This building was so massive and solid in the, in the, in the structure that they rebuilt, they took out floors and completely rebuilt a building within the building, and Building 7. So BBC was referring to this as a Solomon Brothers building, and as she is solemnly reporting its collapse, you can see over her left shoulder Building 7 in the background. It would be 23 more minutes. Now, this, in my opinion, raises the most serious questions about the interaction between the media, the government, and the intelligence agencies. This is an extraordinarily important subject, which Carl Bernstein addressed back in 1977 in an article for Rolling Stone, based on research he had done about the CIA's infiltration of the mass media, where officials with the agency were boasting to him that their greatest successes had been with Time Life, with CBS and with the New York Times. And I say to you, Joe, in 1977, if you could control Time Life, CBS and the New York Times, you had a lock on the American media. And today, the situation has to be overwhelmingly worse. Every now and then, it percolates up and you get a little instance of someone like Armstrong Williams is being paid to write columns. Uh, Ronsfeld creates a whole entity to write articles that are being published in, in Iraqi and, and Middle Eastern newspapers, or you have a, a fake reporter showing up at press conferences to lob softball questions to the press secretary so that everything will come out right and, and favorable to the administration, however they want to spin the news. And these are just the smallest pieces of the tip of the iceberg. These are a few little sprinkles on the birthday cake. The, the real substance, the extent of infiltration in the media has to be massive. In fact, there have been reports that the CIA boasts that it has control of every major figure in the American media. Um, what was the, the term you, uh, to total dominance of the American media? It's very scary, Joe. Yeah. And yet, when you look to the extent to which the American media doesn't cover even a spectacular find like this BBC footage. Uh -huh. Or let me give you an earlier case when, when during a press conference, uh, a reporter asked George W. Bush what role Saddam Hussein had the events in 9-11. The president responded with a single word, nothing. Wow. Now, I expected that word was going to be the headline of every newspaper in the United States and that every news report that evening would use it as their lead story. And in fact, precisely the opposite was the case. You would hardly have known unless you actually had watched the press conference that that had even been said. Or the Senate Select Committee conducts an investigation, the Senate Intelligence Committee conducts an investigation and discovers that not only was Saddam Hussein not in cahoots with Al-Qaeda, but he was seeking to track down and incarcerate and even kill its leaders, which has now been confirmed by the Inspector General for the, De the Pentagon itself, Joe. This is stunning stuff. This has been confirmed by the Inspector General for the Pentagon itself. And get this now, last June, Ed Haas, H-A-A-S, who edits the Muckraker Report, an online investigative journal, discovered that Saddam Hussein was not I, uh, wanted for complicity in the events of 9-11 on his wanted poster. So he made an inquiry of the FBI. And the spokesman, the official no, spokesman... No, no, hold on a second. You're saying Saddam Hussein when you mean Osama bin Laden, I think. Thank you very much. Osama bin Laden, the wanted poster on Osama, did not contain any charges related to 9-11. This, this piqued Ed Haas's curiosity. He called FBI headquarters and spoke with a oh, public. Back, this is back? June, June of 2006. But, I mean, but this confusion, in, when you were saying between Saddam Hussein, it was like when, when um, it was, when Bush said he had nothing to do with it, he was talking about Osama or? Saddam? No, Saddam. Well, oh, that point he was Saddam Hussein. That was Saddam. Okay. Because re remember, three of the major arguments well, that Osama bin Laden did have something to do with the buildings. You think he had uh, he had something to do? Listen, with listen to what I'm telling you now. Okay. Okay. So Ed Haas discovers that the FBI has a wanted poster on Osama bin Laden, and it says nothing about 9/11. Nothing. So he's Osama. curious about this. So he calls the FBI and gets its spokesman uh -huh. for these investigations, Rex Toom, T-O-M-B, and Rex Toom tells Ed Haas. 
that the reason that 9-11 is not mentioned on Osama bin Laden's wanted poster is because the FBI has no hard evidence that Osama bin Laden had any connection to the events of 9-11. Oh, Amen. Carol, Carol Brown of INN World Report, right here, based in New York, was so astonished when she read this that she called FBI headquarters and she read to Rex Toom what Ed Haas had published and Rex Toom confirmed that it was exactly accurate as Ed Haas had published it and that the FBI had no hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden to the events of 9-11. And I say, if anyone has any doubts whether the American government has been lying to the American people about 9-11 from scratch, take note of what we have discovered here. Not only was, uh, did Saddam have no weapons of mass destruction, no chemical, no biological, no nuclear. He wasn't trying to obtain yellow cake from Niger and know what happens to Joe Wilson when he publishes an op-ed piece and his wife, Valerie Plame, is outed. When Valerie Plame is not only a covert agent for the, for the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, but she has a network that is seeking to counter the proliferation of nuclear weapons, Joe, I say to you, her network was probably the single most important in the American intelligence arsenal in terms of keeping America safer from nuclear weapons, okay? And they outed her, and this unquestionably is not a Scooter Libby operation. This went to Dick Cheney, as all the evidence, and Carl Rove, as all the evidence is indicating. These guys and many others were involved in this attack to expose her. But Joe, look what's that doing? That's weakening our, our, our uh, that's increasing our vulnerability to nuclear weapons by weakening our capacity to contain their proliferation. It's this reckless. is one of the most despicable acts in recent American history. Extremely reckless about exactly the thing they said they were worried about. That's right, exactly right. So the government's conduct contra contradicts from scratch the government's position. And I, we say, scholars, if Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11, and if Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with 9-11, then who is responsible for the death of 3,000 American civilians? The survivors of those victims, and in a broad sense that includes every one of us, because look how much American life has changed as a consequence through the Patriot Act, through these wireless, warrantless wiretapping and surveillance, through launching two wars in violation of international law, the UN Charter, and the US Constitution, okay? Our life has been transformed. And yet, so that all of us are entitled to know how and why they died. We therefore consider this to be the highest form of respect we can pay to the dead and their survivors because most certainly the government has not told us. Incidentally, uh, just out of the blue, uh, one more thing to recommend in addition to the books we've talked about is the 9-11 DVD project. I think they're, they're worth a mention. That um, if you go to their website, 9/11 DVD Project um, .org, they have 18 of the best DVDs and several audio CDs, and they'll mail them out to you without you sending them any money. And then, out of the goodness of your heart, you can, if you uh, after you see them, you say, "Wow, this is important stuff." Well, that's terrific. And let me mention, too, the Scholars for 9-11 Truth has a website at 911scholars.org. There are links to many DVDs, videos, audios that you can obtain just by downloading them from the Internet. Ah. There's a category where I have five particular recommended ones that you might want to share with your friends and neighbors. Which are those? Well, they're, they're, they are 9-11 uh, Mysteries, Sophia's. Uh, Loose Change, in w w one of its incarnation, uh, a lecture by David Ray Griffin, a piece that I did on what we know now that we didn't know then, and a piece that I've recently added, which was a lecture I gave in Chicago on religious, moral, and political dimensions of 9-11 that has been extant for some time but not emphasized, and there I'm discussing very, uh, well, relatively profound issues about the nature of morality and how a government could put itself in a mindset that would be willing to undertake issues like this. And it, it explores questions that I have not seen addressed by any other source. Let me just mention, by the way, in relation to scholars, we have no budget, we have no source of funding, all of this is done voluntarily. I have spent, I cannot begin to tell you, uh, untold hundreds of hours maintaining that website. I've been responsible for managing the website from its inception. Oh. And I have, I mean, in addition to doing 
hundreds and hundreds of talk shows and, and, and a good number now of television appearances, including two on Hannity and Combs and one on O'Reilly. Uh, publishing this book is intended to be a benefit to scholars because any income derived from the sale of this book is used to support additional 9-11 research. I'm not making a nickel from this. It's being used to support expenses and fund additional research. So if you not only want a wonderful compendium that will give you a, a balanced, comprehensive introduction to the events of 9-11, you want to buy that book and know that in the process of doing so, you will be supporting additional 9-11 research by scholars. I think you can't say buy because we're not supposed to be commercial. You have to say get. But <laughs> if you were to obtain, <laughs> under what other conditions? Anyhow, books I think are a special category. The books are like um, they got to get out there. Get it. Get it to the library. You know. <laughs> Whatever. Let's just it. say it's available at Amazon.com and your better bookstores where you could browse or buy as you might be disposed. Oh, that's right. You can sit down and read it in the browsing room there. That's right. Oh, by the way, incidentally, too, a feature of this book that I believe is distinctive of 9/11 books Ooh. is a color photo section. We have a color photo section here of the most important photographs on the most important topics. Here you see that uh, gouge in Building 6. Here you see that, that enormous whack out of Building 3. Here you see... Yeah, let go slow. Let's, yeah, okay. Now, now the gouge. Well, let's go back this, then. If this we're, gouge we're is really something. There it is. Oh, yeah, that's in Building 6. Yeah, there's this huge hole. This is the one I was likening, likened to the, likened to the surgical operation. Okay, of taking, tilt, tilt, tilt it down. Which way? And here, of course, is building three. With, here's building three with that enormous gouge in it that I likened to Paul Bunyan with an axe. Sure. Well, this is building six with that enormous gouge that I likened to a surgical operation. I know, and, and its destruction is fascinating. And here's Building 3, which has this hum, humongous gouge in it like a Paul Bunyan with an right axe. Right in the middle. You don't see it in the yeah, facade. Right in the middle. And here's a whole bunch of dustification taking place of the building. And it opens, the color photo section opens with a spectacular photograph. How, how, anyone, how anyone could possibly study the photographic record here and believe that this was any kind of collapse or that conventional explosives could have brought about these effects is beyond me. The evidence, in my judgment, is overwhelming. And once you go beyond, listen, we, Joe, we also have, have here. Anybody in Congress saying that? Listen right? to this. Yeah. Here we have Building 7, several photographs that demonstrate how Building 7 was brought down. Building 7 was brought down by a controlled demolition. You can see the characteristic kink in the, in the roof of Building wait, 7. Wait, wait, just give me a chance. We need a little time to focus. Yeah. Here we have several frames from the sequence, and elsewhere in the book you can find a, a, a 9 or a 12 frame sequence that's even more... Well, uh, our, our, our uh, viewers have seen 7. Yeah, down. yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they, they know that one. Well, and here's, here's a whole page devoted to the bathtub. So if anyone had any... If anyone had any doubts about the bath... If any, just right here where I'm pointing. That's if anyone had any doubts about the that bathtub, here we have a diagram of the bathtub. There, or no, just wait, there, just wait. The bathtub is just a, a bunch of concrete to keep the water out. That's right. Yeah. And here we have the excavation of the bathtub that shows the bathtub remained intact. Yeah, it is. Oh, that's the bathtub. All of this is a bathtub, yeah. This is a diagram. This is the actual bathtub after excavation. Excavation. Here you're showing from inside the, uh, I think, the north tower, the bathtub. And here's a here's the subway to show that it wasn't flooded. All right. The, here we go. Okay. Here. Oh, okay. All right. What we in, in the, this general area here was a great big space where both towers sat. And it was this, um, you can see, it's still intact on the perimeter of the bathtub. And here it is above it, showing the same, same general geometry. You had this same curvy concrete that surrounds the, the under sub-basement part of the structure. Well, the implications are that yeah, okay. Oh, well, his, well, his point was that 
they had to resort to powderizing so that that much bulk would not uh, present a danger to um, popping the uh, shattering the bathtub shattering the bathtub which then would have flooded under lower Manhattan undermined the foundation of many other structures gone into the subway system and the path train tunnel underneath the river well no well what I'm picturing though actually is that the steel beams, as they are, get their 45 degree cut by the cutting charges, they're going to all end up poking down into the bathtub, more or less. And so the question is, how many of those steel beams can just sort of um, accumulate down there in the bottom six uh, floors? And um, what else do you have there for those, for that bathtub to? Um, to accommodate is uh, all the floor trusses. Uh, oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, the mass. I mean, then we're talking 500,000 tons per building. So let's assume that we got rid of the concrete because it was foamy four inches thick with uh, either exotic weapons or lots of distributed explosives of some kind. Nevertheless, you still didn't lose the floor trusses. So they have to accumulate there. And um, in a way, they do buttress up the... Um, the edges, the walls of the bathtub, if you can get all that mass in there, then it would be sort of like a dam, as long as the wall... The well, but it's not coming down gently, Joe, Joe. mind you. It's coming down at, the, at least at the, you know, at the speed of gravity, and the impact is going to be enormous. Well, no, there are more pages. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So what else we have here that... What else you want? Well, I mean, you just... Uh, No, the fact of the matter is if the buildings had actually collapsed in their totality, they would have shattered the bathtub. There would have been this massive flooding. It would have taken out the subway system and the path train tunnels and undermined the foundation of other skyscrapers in lower Manhattan. This was all done, Joe, to contain the damage. In fact, when you look at exactly which buildings were taken out, it's as though these terrorists had the plan to, to destroy all and only buildings with WTC designations. <laughs> World Trade, Trade Center. Center. I see. Now, which is like what, what a way a controlled demolition would take. Where, of course, contract. Larry Silverstein had insured the World Trade Center for 3.5 billion against terrorist attack. Six weeks before. Yeah, six weeks before, and he claimed double indemnity because there were two planes and two attacks. Right. Now here we have a sequence on the Pentagon. Here you see the initial hit point. As I said, it's only about 10 feet high, 16 or 17 feet wide. This is before, this is after the upper floor fell. Many people don't know the upper floor didn't fall for 20 or 30 minutes after the initial impact. Here is an explosion that occurred of the Pentagon. Did not fall until 20 to 30 minutes after the initial hit on the building. Now here is an explosion that took place, but you already see there's already smoke in the vicinity, so this can't be the initial hit on the building. In fact, Karen Kawatowski, who is a lieutenant colonel stationed in the Pentagon, said they, they saw a gigantic fireball, but they didn't feel any impact from a, a plane hitting the building, and that she walked out and saw, as you can see here, a clear, clean, green, smooth lawn Ooh, with no that, evidence of any plane, with no evidence. Shot of the lawn. Look this at is, in my opinion, the smoking gun at the Pentagon. So pristine. Be, you know, because if the plane, for example, had been following that trajectory just above ground, it would have been creating massive wake turbulence from the jet thrusters. They would have been chewing up the lawn. Look, they can throw automobiles that get into their wake up in the air. You know, okay? actually, Jim, uh, on that subject, if you take seriously the official story that the nose went into the round hole in the facade of the Pentagon. And you just trace where the nose is going through, the bottom of the circle, you know, let's say it's like a 16, 30, whatever, 16 foot circle where the nose is going through. The bottom of that hole is like how many feet from the ground? Five feet at the most? I think we're talking about apples and oranges, Joe. There was a second floor building, a uh, hole on the second floor, but this is actually on the ground floor. This is on the ground floor, and it's only 10 feet high and about 15, 16 feet wide. Okay, hole. this is the alleged entry point. Okay, now that, that what I'm getting at was that the bottom of this hole, the bottom of it, is how far from the ground? It's on the ground. It's on ground floor. That's why I'm telling you that we're talking about two different holes, see? 
There was a hole in the second floor. There was a second floor window that sometimes has been suggested mistakenly to have been the hit point. I'm not showing that here, Joe. This is the actual hit point, okay? And it's there's on the ground cars, floor. Cars yeah, there are cars, right, in the immediate foreground. That's right. There's fence. There are unbroken windows all around it, you Joe. Know, I, I've never seen these cars. All right. I have to say that I, I, I saw spools before, but I never saw cars. Joe, I'm telling you, there's been a lot of confusion right, but, here. But, but I wanted to add, though, that's all. My, my little point I was going to make. Go ahead. Was that if, let's assume the nose of the plane went into that little hole, then the wings would have been just about right there on the ground, and therefore the engines would have been another nine feet below that. That's true, Joe. That's absolutely true. The engines would be in the ground, under the ground, if, if this is where the plane had impacted it nose first. You're absolutely right. And its wingspan is 125 feet. And the wings aren't there. The engines aren't there. The luggage, the bodies, the seats, they aren't there. The tail isn't there. Look at this. Where is the plane? Look at that lawn. It's perfectly green, smooth as a putting surface. I expect Tiger Woods to show up with his caddy and start practicing his game. This, not, okay. not, not a blemish. And this is the smoking gun at the Pentagon, yeah, believe me. Right. But here is from that one frame that the con Pentagon conveniently labeled plane. And here you see is a, a silhouette of a Boeing 757 to the same scale as the tail just above the gate mechanism. And notice this white plume here, Joe. Uh, I've discussed this with pilots. Multiple yeah. pilots have pointed out that's not from the jet engines of the plane. That's the plume from a missile. So this appears to be this small plane firing the missile in, which would take out the budget experts in the Pentagon trying to track the $2.3 trillion. Okay? And you need the missile to make sure you get them. Because if you just wait for the plane to impact, it can bounce around. You don't know exactly where it's going to hit. The physics of this would be like a billiard ball, okay, except with many pieces and parts. Except, alas, of course, none of them are present here. You have this perfectly smooth, clean. It was a French investigative reporter by the name of Thierry Meissen who published two books very early on. One's called Pentagate. The other's called 9-11, The Big Lie, where he pointed out this whole Pentagon story was a farce. I'll tell you something else I've discovered, though it's not visible here. There was a lot of black plume smoke coming up from the Pentagon. It's coming from a series of dumpsters in front of the buildings, Joe. It's oh. not coming from inside the building. It was a special effect. Oh. It's from a series of dumpsters. So when I give my, my standard presentation, I point out with three frames how you can see the smoke is coming from the dumpsters. And look, the reason for that, Joe, is this. They didn't want all the members of Congress, remember, they're unloading the Capitol, come out on the steps and to look across the Potomac and not see something impressive. So they needed that dark billowing smoke to guarantee it. They staged it from these giant dumpsters. I had a fellow come through Duluth about a year ago who had 44 more frames showing the black smoke coming from this series of dumpsters. And the angle was such that you could see clear space between the dumpsters and the building. I mean, talk about a farce. So this lieutenant colonel I was telling about, Karen Kotowski, said they saw a fireball, felt no impact. She walked out and looked around, and she could see no evidence, no remnants of any plane having hit the building. Has Karen joined your group? Uh, she is out there. She's a contributor to the book by David Ray Griffin. Oh, okay. And whether Karen is a member of Scholars, I don't recall, but uh, she's, she's, she's speaking speak out. out. Yeah. yeah. She has a chapter in the so same book is, where just... You know, these pictures are a wonderful contribution, really. Yeah, and the next page is one more page about Pennsylvania, okay? Because this 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 this, is this appears to be a yeah what may have been a, a fake photograph that's supposed to be from the crash in Pennsylvania. It it looks much more as though it's staged. However, in fact, we have an Air Force expert, Colonel George Nelson, who told me that the crash scene and it's here down below the crash scene there, which shows no remnants of any aircraft, looked to him as though they'd taken a bulldozer out, dug a ditch, filled it with trash, and blown it up. Uh huh. Okay. Blown it up after they fill it with trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, it, and something else that's fascinating is these, uh, see, there, there are other photographs scattered throughout the book. I mean, here's more of the pulverization, oh, right? Yeah, more, yeah, they're scattered throughout. Yeah, here's know, another is, dustification. Look at that, those test it's that just stunning. It's absolutely story. stunning. Now, and, you, and, and, and there's more. Photographs, that was your pick? Yeah, oh yeah, I filled in the spaces where I had space. Here was a study by a group of Purdue engineers that was supposed to show how the Boeing 757 disappeared because it was shredded by the support columns. But they, they oddly omitted a significant feature from their model, namely the engines, Joe. Maybe they thought the plane just sort of was a glider. You know, it didn't need any, any source of energy. Kind of and here is something utterly fascinating. 
These are photographs of the so-called wilted cars. There are 1,400 of these cars, some in parking lots, that have weird kinds of damage, Joe. Look at this second page. Yeah. Well, the, these, the, the, these on the top are on FDR Drive, and there are others here that are, okay, okay. Yeah, that are crumpled up. Some of them are crushed. They look like beer cans after a fraternity party. But when we get this report of this Volkswagen bus that was loaded with Iraqis that was hit with some weapon, they heard no noise, they have no idea what it was, and they said it wilted like a wet cloth. You see, that is very suggestive that part of the reason for going to war was to test out a new generation of weapons. In fact, a Russian expert on these issues said that the United States wanted to go to war. The military industrial complex wanted this war so they could try out new generation of weapons to demonstrate to the Department of Defense that they actually work so the Department of Defense would buy them. He said this was an experiment on people in a live war theater to justify vast new expenditures on new classes of weapons. In the name of salesmanship. In the name of salesmanship. This was, this was the testing ground. Let me just mention one or two other features. Uh, one or two other features of the book. I mean, not only are there other photographs here. Let's take a look at the cover one more time. Uh, at least the 9/11 conspiracy, the scamming of America, and these are a collection of helpful clues to develop the human mind, chosen by our guest James Fetzer. So this is your your. This is my first book on 9-11. Yeah, I published three edited collections on JFK, which were seeking to place the study of the assassination of our 35th president on an objective and scientific foundation. This book achieves the same purpose of seeking to place the study of 9-11 on an objective and scientific foundation. But in addition to, you know, sorting out analytically what's going on here and all the governmental abuse about, say, the use of the phrase, you know, conspiracy theory being thoroughly unpacked, it goes extensively into the rationale and motivation for what, for what was going on. One of the wonderful chapters, by the way, is yeah. by a, a fellow named Craig Firmage, who, who talks about intersecting facts and theories about 9-11. And he provides a wonderful graph about how, if you take some 42 facts that are known about the, uh, about the events of 9-11, whether they support the government's account that it was taken unaware, had no idea, or whether the government could have helped, simply helped to manage it along, or whether the government had to be complicit. There's a consistent pattern here that for these 42 different evidential factors that the government had to be complicit. This is a fascinating essay, yeah, Joe, a fascinating is. essay. I'll read again. The, the three columns, the three columns are... They caught us off guard, they let it happen, or they made it happen, and the, or he calls it create a new reality, and sure enough, the facts are consistent with they made it happen. And there's a wonderful essay here by David Ray Griffin, who may be the leading expert on 9-11 in the world, talking about 9-11 myth or reality. And here's something I'll bet you didn't know, Joe. The fellow who wound up being the chief, uh, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission, his name is Philip Zelikow. Really? Not only was he from the inner sanctum of the Bush administration, he helped to oversee the transition in the national security apparatus from Clinton to Bush. He had co-authored a book with Condoleezza Rice. But get this, he is an expert in what field? He's not an historian. He's not a scientist. Don't tell me. Let me guess. Don't tell me. The creation and maintenance of public myths. That's right. He's an expert in the creation and manipulation of political myths. That's what the guy does, and that's what he did. He created, he created a myth. Oh, what year? What? what did you mean after after having heard what? from me? No, I think that, 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 that Paul is just asking about my background. Oh. Where I have a my my PhD is in the history of science and the philosophy of science, where the history of science is dominated by the history of of, of uh, physics. I have uh, published 28 books in my career, over 150 articles and reviews. I have founded an international journal and international book series. I have a great deal of scholarly expertise in these areas, having spent the last 35 years teaching logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning. So. <laughs> Thanks, for Joe. Giving truth thanks, my friend. <laughs> Terrific. Good. Great. Here, good Privilege to be on.